Good evening and welcome to our second session to the Bible's big story, the gospel promised and fulfilled. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. We thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. And we just want to give you the glory, the honor, the praise tonight. As we study your word and we seek to, to understand uh, the big story that you've revealed to us through your word and connected to the smaller uh, parts. I ask that your spirit would speak to each one of us, give us eyes to see what we see, give us ears to hear what we hear. May we understand, may your word transform our lives and may we do your will, Father God. Father, I pray for this ongoing crisis that you would be with each person here in, in specific situations that they encounter. May you guide and direct and give wisdom and clarity. And Father God, I do ask that your spirit would, would continue to remain here and that you would just guide us during this time. We give, you, uh, we give you this time committed to you. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things by faith. Alone, amen. Okay, so we are going to get into, we're going to go ahead and get into the text tonight. And uh, uh, what we'll do is, Hopefully everyone tried the homework and we will be doing that second. We want to finish some of the introductory issues. So what we'll do is we'll just work through this PowerPoint slide. We'll focus on, on the various texts moving towards a couple big conclusions and foundational truths. And then Lord willing, we'll start creation by the word. So we'll start creation by the word, hopefully tonight. So let's go ahead and just work through this PowerPoint. And so this is session number two. Uh, of the Bible's big story. We're finishing introductory issues and also starting, Lord willing, creation by the word. Just a, a quick brief overview of the session. We will discuss, as I mentioned, the introductory issues. So we'll finish defining the gospel, looking at the gospel's relationship to kingdom, the gospel's relationship to covenants, because they're all really interconnected. And I, and I hope that you'll see these connecting points. And, and the benefit for making these connections is that in the Old Testament, the word gospel is not always used, but it's always connected with these, with these blessings from God. Covenant is a blessing uh, from, from God. This idea of kingdom is also a blessing from God. And so I do hope that we'll, we'll, see, these, we'll see these connections. Um, and then, Lord willing, we're going, we're going to get into the... the First part of this big story, creation by the word and the Adamic covenant. And I'm very excited to be, to be talking about the, this, this first story tonight. So, uh, and then lastly, Lord willing, we'll also discuss briefly the homework. We can also, we can discuss the questions d during that second part. If you have questions for, from your homework, I, I do want to hear some of your observations, some of the questions that you have. And so we'll see how this goes. Okay, so just briefly, we're going to go through here very fast. So uh, maybe you could write a comment down, but this is just review from last week. Uh, we talked about making good observations and asking good questions. And that's very important if we're going to be interpreting the Word of God, if we're going to be making applications. So again, this is just review from last week. So some of the, some of the, the questions and observations we need to be making are related to the parts of a sentence. And so within a sentence, who is the one doing the action? Who is the actor? Uh, what is the action? So really identifying those action words. Uh, who is receiving the, the action? What, uh, who is the one the action is being done to? Okay. What is the object? So sometimes the object's a person. Sometimes it's a thing. Sometimes it's a concept. So what, what is the object? Or what is the object of the sentence? And then, of course, how are these person or persons being described? So, uh, and then also, how is the action being described or qualified? And then just concerning related to persons, we have, we have some, also some good questions. How is God being described? So I hope that you'll see in Genesis that God is described in a certain way. Uh, what are his actions? What does he do? And so it's very important. Comparing and contrasting what God does or what we're called to do is important. How is man described? 
What is he required to do? How does God communicate his will and law to man? So I hope that we're starting to see that there's, in Genesis 1 and 2, there's a will, and God's will is being communicated to man. I, I hope that everyone can see that in, uh, in your first assignment. I, I hope that, that you can see that. And then, of course, what are God's promises? There's even a promise in Genesis 1 and 2, so we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, and then also just ending, uh, what are God's requirements? So God also gave some requirements in Genesis 1 and 2, and we'll, we'll look at that as well. What is man's relationship to God? Is Jesus Christ present in the passage of Scripture? How does this passage relate to Jesus Christ? And of course, lastly, what, uh, how does Scripture relate this passage to Jesus? So I hope, I hope and trust that some of these questions really kind of uh, piqued your interest because I was doing the assignment as well with you and this week, and I was seeing some of these things. Okay, so last week we got into 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, and that's a fundamental passage for us to learn. And, and in, and in um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, we were able to define the gospel. And so we were able to define this good news. And so we were able to define it and really give the, the, fundamental, uh, the fundamental component of our, the fundamental content of the gospel. Now, what we didn't do is, is someone asked a question after the class, which is really good. And they said, well, what about these other parts that seem to be really connected with the gospel? And, and so my comment was, this is not all we are to say about the gospel, but this is the most fundamental. So I want to be very clear. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 is not everything about the gospel, but it's the most important. It's, it's the, without this fact, uh, there is no good news. Okay, so what was that really core, that core truth? And so looking at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, we won't return there because of, for time's sake, you could meditate on that more. I also actually posted, I posted a, a really a, a nice breakdown of the passage on, on our group and also on Interpreting with the Word Facebook page. But the fundamental truth of the gospel is the Messiah died for our sins. That's the, that's the fundamental good news that everything turns on. Without the Messiah dying for our sins, there is no good news for mankind. And I hope that perhaps not tonight because we're focusing on creation, but Sigurado, next week or the following week when we go into the fall of mankind, we're going to really see why it's so important has to die for our sins. Part of the good news is not just that the Messiah dies. If he dies and is not resurrected, <laughs> we are, we, uh, the, the Apostle Paul says, we are to be pitied among men. We are fools. The Messiah dying is not enough. The Messiah dying is not enough. He has resurrected the new man, the incorruptible life that will never die. And it's in that resurrection that Christ vindicates that, 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 that God the Father vindicates the work of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, and he says, this, this is acceptable. In the resurrection of Jesus, God the Father is saying, the sacrifice is acceptable. My wrath is, paid. My wrath is, is a big word, propitiated. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's made favorable. The word propitiation, you'll see that in some of your in some of your Bibles, in Romans chapter 3, that, that he is made favorable, that the sin is canceled, and God's wrath is appeased. And so Romans, Romans 5, 1, the great passage, having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace compared to wrath. We have peace with God. And so of everything else, this is the most important, most fundamental truth uh, of the gospel. And of course, we also talked about that this was not a new news. This was not different news. This was actually declared by God in the Old Testament. And so then the last part that we discussed last week was what is our response? And we had several. We are to preach it. We're to receive it. We're to stand on it. 
We are being saved by it. So it is saving us. We are not saving ourselves. Our works are not saving ourselves. God is saving us through this good news. And specifically, it's the sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins, and then him giving us his righteousness. And then lastly, we have to be holding fast to it, living by faith. So that's just a brief summary from last week. Uh, we have the video posted, so if you want to look at that more, I, I would really encourage you to go on, on to, to YouTube and watch the video. And so the next passage we want to look at is, so the first passage was uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. What is this core uh, idea of the gospel, and where is it proclaimed? And we see it's in the Old Testament, and we have this foundational truth. Let's go in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 to 6, because we're going to see a, a, a new component, a new aspect of the gospel that we need to be considering here. So let's, if you can, just turn in your Bibles to First Corin uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. There is a lot that is said here. And so I am not going to be highlighting everything that this passage says, because we have several passages to work through. Uh, you could do the observations and questions on your own as an additional assignment you, if you want. I, I won't grade it, but uh, you, can, uh, you, you, can, you can do it on your own time. I, I will just highlight some important parts that are, are moving towards uh, some of these introductory issues. So let's go ahead and read the word of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, having this ministry by, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of truth, we would, condemn, uh, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In, the, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So I hope you're seeing <laughs> some of the references to Genesis 1 and 2. For we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So there is a lot being said here. We don't have time to go to everything. I do want to just highlight several really important truths that that we should be contemplating as we're, we're dealing with these introductory issues and defining the gospel. So there is, there is a slight, there's a further clarification, there's a, a complementary idea that's being taught here about the gospel. So uh, I just want to first highlight that you have here a reference to the gospel. So this is the primary we can say this is the primary uh, subject or topic. So just as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 is very important, uh, this will also be very important to be considering. So here, the gospel is, the gospel is veiled. Okay, it's veiled. This is the action. And what we see here, it's veiled or covered to those who are perishing. And then in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. So again, this is a, a lack of belief in Jesus Christ. So this is, not, this is not a generic belief in God. This is not a belief in a certain set of truths. This belief, we could define belief as faith 
uh, trust. This is a belief. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the, the, the mind of unbelievers, uh, that's the fundamental problem with the person. It's not that they, they're missing a component of baptism or they're missing enough good works. The fundamental description of someone who is not, who is perishing, uh, this, this idea here of, of perishing, the, fundam the fundamental issue is unbelief. The fundamental issue of unbelief. And this is, this is uh, looking at these two ideas. The gospel has failed. So remember from last week, our job is to, is to receive it. Our job is to stand on it. Our job is to cling to it every day. And here, what Paul is saying is that the gospel is veiled. It's hidden. We could say this word is, is hidden. Okay, it's hidden from them. And we see that the reason is that this, the God of this world, or this would be, uh, we could identify this as Satan, as, as the devil. He has blinded, he has blinded their minds, okay? To, to, he's blinded their minds to what? He has blinded their minds to what? And we really see that here. He, he's keeping them from seeing, look at this. They, they cannot see what is the object here. Look at this object. The light of the gospel. This is, this is a, a, a terrible situation to be in, is more than, than anything else, is being blinded and not being able to value, to value the gospel. And we look here, look at, so, so the light of the gospel is veiled from them. They cannot see it. But look how it describes the gospel. Look how it describes the gospel. Here it's no longer, there's no mention of sin. Rather, you have this, uh, this reference here. The glory of Christ. The glory of Christ. What, what we, what, if we were to investigate this idea of glory of Christ, in the New Testament, what is being taught here is this idea that, that one of the results, one of the results of becoming a son of God. So this is a result of being a son of God. is that we are, we uh, see the glory of God. And that is being, the glory of God is literally uh, revealed to us in Christ. And then the second thing is that we are, we are being, conformed to that image and one day we will receive this glory. So not only is the gospel us being saved from our sins, the gospel promises us that we will be renewed in the image, and, and this is and this is where it is. Who is the who is the Christ? He is the one who is in the image of God. And we we uh, we are promised here. We see it. Okay, in other passages in other passages of Scripture, we will eventually be conformed to this image of God, the glory of Christ. As he is, we will be, okay? Uh, when we are resurrected, incorruptible, okay? But what I want us to see here is there's this new idea of, of what the gospel provides for us, okay? And so as people talked about, uh, someone mentioned, like, well, what about the return of Christ? 
Yeah, so this would be an emphasis upon one day we are going to see him when he returns. So, so we're now expanding this idea of the gospel. But I want us to really focus on here. What I want us to focus on is this, okay? Uh, for what we proclaim, so here, this is the action. Uh, Paul and, and his, the, the people, his, the servants that are with him, they are not proclaiming themselves. They are proclaiming Jesus Christ, okay? But it's not Jesus Christ, uh, it's not Jesus Christ uh, generically. It's very specific. Jesus Christ is the object of their proclamation. Uh, so this would be object, person, And this would be object uh, complement. They are proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Some people say Jesus is Lord. Okay. Now I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not referring to there is a church in the Philippines. Jesus is Lord, and so I'm not referring to that church. No doubt they maybe they took their name from from a passage like this. There's some other passages in Romans. Uh, we won't really discuss them tonight. What I want to emphasize, though, is that is that how can we how can we restate this? Um, what are some significances to this statement, uh, Jesus Christ as Lord? Let me ask the question. This, this will be a time for discussion right now. Looking at this idea of Jesus is Lord, what are some significances that we, that, that we should be able to identify with this statement, Jesus as Lord? Think about, for those who are maybe pastors or you're familiar, what are some, this idea here, what does this convey? Let's have a, a brief discussion. So I want to get feedback. This I want to get specific. What does it mean? If, you're going to preach a sermon and you're going to proclaim Jesus as Lord. How would you explain that to, to your members, to your, to your congregants? He's not just a prophet. Great. Okay, good. So he's more than a prophet. So, so who is he, Bethany? Give me, give me some, go, go deep on me here. He's king. He's Lord of the universe. Okay, so, yes, great. Excellent. So for those in Christianity 101, right, we talked about the lordship. The, that fundamental idea of lordship, right? The lordship of Jesus, and we could also say king. What is the famous, the most famous passage in scripture that, that declares that Jesus, it's unequivocal. It's, it declares that Jesus is the king of the universe, and he's given us a command. Can anyone think it's very it's a very famous passage that we that we always quote during missions <laughs> during missions week? What is that passage? Of kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay, yes. Yeah, so in Revelation, we in Revelation we have this. Uh, I believe Revelation 19, it talks about him being a king of kings and Lord of King of kings and Lord of lords. What else? I'm thinking of a very famous passage that is fundamental for discipleship. What is that passage where it is unequivocal that Jesus is the king of the universe? Lord of kings, sorry, Lord of lords. What is that passage? I'm going to give you a hint. It's in Matthew. Matthew 27 or 28, the Great Commission. Can you say it to me? Can you give it to me? Oh, Danny. Well, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bethany. Uh, I, can I read it? What do you want? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. Uh, all authority. It's a, a slightly different way of saying it, but all authority is given to him. Right? So this is, this is declaring the lordship the lordship of Jesus. So this this is part this here is part of the gospel message. That's the big takeaway for us. Now there's one other thing I really want to emphasize here. 
Jesus as Lord, Jesus, uh, let me just see something here. I don't want to misspeak. Hold on one second. Someone else want to add? Okay, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 to 22, God's word say, God's power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Wow. So that is that is the lordship. That is just above every name, above everything, above every power. Uh, so here's something to think about. Last week, we looked at Jesus being the savior of us, uh, uh, saving us from our sins, Diva. So he is savior. Here, we're looking at Jesus is Lord. So he is savior and Lord. Okay, so, so do you see those two components in the gospel now uh when you actually look my translation has jesus as lord does someone have a different translation in their bible that's not the same as jesus uh jesus as lord if you have a different translation if you want to read it you can read it and then boy, i forgot to get to you so after we make this point you can make your comment um any different translation uh king james version yeah. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Boom. Okay, that's different. I like that. Jesus Christ the Lord. Anyone else? If you say Jesus Christ the Lord, who do you think about? We're going to the Old Testament now. Who, who, who do you think about the Lord in the Old Testament context? The I am. It's the Father. Uh, yes and no. So, so it's equating Jesus with the Father, but he's different. So, so, so uh, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is the I am of the Old Testament, but he's different than the Father. So this would be actually a, a, a passage to support uh, the divinity and equality of Jesus with the Father, but distinct. Does everyone see that? And so the big takeaway that we have here is that G it's more than Jesus is has authority. It's more than Jesus is Lord. You know, people will say he's Lord of my life. Okay. That, that's a good statement. Okay. I'm not, I'm not attacking that, but it's more than that. It's more than that. Uh, he is uh, the Lord as in Yahweh. Okay. Now you, you'll probably see people that say, Oh no, it's just Lord servant. Okay. So, and, and that would be a different, that would be a different conclusion, but, but, um, Reading what Henry read, reading, looking at this idea of authority, we, we would want to say both and. It's incredible news if Jesus is, in fact, the Lord, Yahweh, of the Old Testament, okay? Any questions or comments, or are, are you tracking with me here? When, uh, when uh, mentioned is Jesus as Lord, I think it refers to his being a master. Yeah. Where... Uh, you command respect and he is to be obeyed. Everything he says has to be obeyed in that sense. Because uh, there is this uh, very bad connotation, uh, quote unquote, huh? quote unquote connotation that we appreciate Jesus being our savior, but we don't want him to be our Lord. We don't want to obey him. We just want to, him to be our savior. Yeah. That's, that's where the difference of being a savior and Lord yes. comes into a different uh, context. Yes. Excellent point, Koyobo Boy. You get the gold star because, <laughs> no, I'm being serious because people will say, let's just get them, that, that make them make a profession of faith and the person has no intention of listening to what Jesus says. And so they say, yes, I'm sorry for my sin. I don't want to go to hell. I want to get the free gift of salvation. Well, uh, part, of, part of repenting means that you commit to following Jesus all your days and what he says you do. Ah, no, 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 I cannot, I cannot commit to that. I still have my fun. I'll give one example. There was someone I knew in the U.S. We're all adults here. We're all in ministry. So no doubt you will hear this. I shared with him the gospel. We became good friends. We, we met through working out at the gym. And you know what he said to me? He said, Tim, what you're saying makes sense. 
I, 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 it, it's probably true, but I love my sex too much. He said, I love sex too much. I cannot give it up. And I said to him, you know what? At least you're honest. At least you're honest and, and you're truthful. When the rubber meets the road, someone who will not allow Jesus to be the Lord does not really want the sacrifice. He does not want, the, you know, they want it on their own terms. They're not really trusting in Jesus for the sacrifice. Because if they were truly trusting in Jesus for the sacrifice, they would, uh, they would see with their eyes, right? They would see their, the, the blindness would be gone, right? There would be no more blindness, all right? Coming down here, and this is going to be beneficial for our study later on, is that for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. So this is going right back to Genesis, going right back to Genesis. The God who said, let light shine from darkness has shown in our hearts to what? So whereas the, 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 the God of this world has blinded so they cannot see the gospel, the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, God shown in our hearts. <laughs> Let light shine in darkness, literal, easy. God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here's my question to ask you. Is Jesus a physical being forevermore? Yes, right? Jesus is now the, 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 the new man, right? We see the God who is invisible. You cannot see spirit. We can see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, the vision of the exalted Christ. We don't have time to go there. Uh, go there and read after reading this, the John, the John the Apostle falls on his face. He cannot even look at the vision of the exalted Christ. He fell as a dead man. I would encourage you, read Revelation chapter 1, 9 to verse 20. It's so powerful. But I, wanna, I just want to highlight here that, that God, the one, who, the one who said, let, let, let light shine in darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And, and we'll, we'll come back to this point, Sigurado, later in this semester. But I want to really emphasize uh, this idea of Jesus Christ as Lord, as part of the gospel. This is a fundamental component of the gospel. The fact that Jesus is both Lord, as in he is the king of our lives, and he is the literal Lord. Okay, so again, and this is very important because this lordship, so let's go clear here. This lordship also, we, we have this, we have this word and this word. This, these ideas denote kingdom. They denote the idea of kingdom. Okay, do you see that? And so in looking at this word kingdom, this concept of kingdom, we automatically see the relationship with the gospel. Does everyone see that? So, so when we see the kingdom of God, when we see uh, the Son of God reigning, when we see, we're already speaking of the gospel. We're already speaking of the good news, or, or at least a benefit, uh, um, a benefit of the gospel in the coming of the kingdom, but also a core component of the gospel. That is, Jesus is Lord. Okay, that is part of the good news. Okay, any questions or comments before we go on to the next passage? Okay, so we're going to, let's just highlight some main points here from 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6. Uh, of course, earlier in the context, it talks about declaring the gospel. So we have, again, this idea of proclamation of the gospel. The, the content of the gospel in this case is the glory of Christ. Okay, so that's one of the, the components that the gospel provides for us, that we are, we are going to see the glory of Christ, we're going to be conformed to the glory of Christ. And this idea, this proclamation that Jesus is Lord, the God of the Old Testament, he uh, included in this is uh, 
is this idea of kingship or kingdom, okay? We're, 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 gonna, we're transitioning now into kingdom and covenant, okay? And then lastly, this is, this is a teaser, okay? This is a teaser. God's first creative work, the creating of physical light, that is comparable to his new creative work in our hearts. Does everyone see that? There's a correlation here. So when we see light in the world, when we contemplate light, we should be thinking about the spiritual truth of the light of the gospel in our hearts. Okay, so uh, just a teaser, just, <laughs> just, a, just an appetizer here. Okay, let's go to the next passage of scripture here. Uh, so now we're transitioning. Now we're transitioning to uh, looking at this idea of kingdom now. So we've, I, we've, the core is our salvation from our sin, the gospel. Uh, a second point is this idea of the lordship. Jesus is Lord Yahweh. Jesus is also uh, uh, his lordship over us. And then with the lordship and him being Lord, we have this idea of, of God's kingdom, the kingdom. So let's go now in your Bibles to Mark 1, 14 to 15. Perhaps this will make more sense when you look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. Very famous passage. Very famous passage. Let's, let's go to it and let's... Look at it. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. The word of the Lord says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came from Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. What is the content of the gospel in this content? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent <laughs> and believe in the gospel. So this Looking at this other setup that I made, this kind of makes perfect sense why Jesus comes on the scene and the content of his gospel is not sin, per se, but in this particular context, we have, we have him proclaiming the kingdom of God. So let's just highlight several things. So Jesus comes, this act of proclaiming. So this is something that we're going to see throughout the New Testament, this idea of proclamation. Uh, if you're reading in, in a in more technical scholarly works, they'll say it's kerma. It's that's the Greek word for proclamation. And so oftentimes when you hear proclamation, it's in the context of proclaiming the gospel or good news. So whenever you see this word proclaiming, we, you should be looking for gospel or a gospel type context. Okay. And so the content of of Jesus's proclamation is uh, the gospel of God. So it's like, okay, great. Uh, but then here, we have the actual content. So what is the message that Jesus is proclaiming? So we're going to be able to equate this with two ideas. One, one, two. Number one is this idea of, of fulfillment. So what's, what's, if I say fulfillment, what's the, what's the, if I say fulfillment, what word are you looking for prior to fulfillment? What's the word that kind of goes with fulfillment? Does anyone know? Anyone want to give a guess? What's the word that we, we typically include with fulfillment? Prophecy. Prophecy. Prophecy or promise, right? We could say pro prophecy or uh, promise, right? You have a prophecy, you have a promise, and then it's fulfilled, right? So what, what I'm trying to get at is the time is fulfilled, meaning to say that something that was promised, a prophecy that was pr promised is coming in the reality. So, so what's implied here is, Old Testament is implied here. The Old Testament promises are fulfilled. The prophecy of the Old Testament, that time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. We could also use, I like the word that, that Koya Bobo used, this idea of completed. And so we have this, the time is fulfilled, the time is completed. The kingdom of God is near, is, is at hand, okay? So we have this idea of 
kingdom of God, okay? And then our response, what is our response? Again, we talked about response in the past. Both of these are commands. Command one, command two. And, and the object of the belief is the gospel. Does everyone see that? The object of the belief is the gospel. But what I want to draw your attention to here, the big takeaway is the connection of gospel, the connection of gospel with, with the kingdom of God. So when, so when we're speaking about, Paul will talk about in Acts, about proclaiming the kingdom of God. Um, uh, whenever there's this idea of proclamation of the kingdom of God, that is part of this gospel, okay? I won't, we won't turn there because we don't have time, but I want to read, you can write down this passage of scripture here. Just write down this passage of scripture. Write down uh, Colossians chapter 1 in verse 13, verses 12 to 14. I'm just going to read it, and then you can, just, you can just follow along. Or you can just listen to me. So I'll, I'll begin in verse 11. So this is a prayer of David, David I mean, a prayer of Paul for the, for the Colossian believers. And he says this, uh, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain or the kingdom of darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. <laughs> so from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, so what I want us to see here is that what, the way everything turns is on this core component that we talked about before, the, the sacrifice of sins. And now because we have our sins atoned for, we can be members of God's kingdom. So, so in one sense, we can proclaim the kingdom of God and we also should be talking about sins, okay? So is everyone tracking with me there? Everyone's tracking. Uh, we can also look at John, John uh, 3, 1 to 21, right? Unless a man is born of, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> so, so, so the new birth precedes the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is, central as well to the proclamation of the gospel. Okay, I hope everyone's tracking with me there. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, great. So let's, let's go to some, to some points here. So we have uh, the gospel's content is the lordship of the Messiah. Okay, so we still have this idea of lordship, right? Jesus is proclaiming uh, the kingdom, right? So, he's, so there's this idea of lordship. The New, Testament, the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is not separate from the gospel, but interconnected. It's part of this good news, okay? Not the most fundamental, but part of the good news, okay? Uh, so I've given you for your own time, if you want to study Colossians 1, 12 to 14. I also gave you John 3, 1 to 21. Another great passage is Matthew 24, 14. And the gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed to the whole world as a witness, and then the end will come. So there it's literally the gospel of the kingdom. So you will actually see this in the gospel of Matthew. Jesus is proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? And so again, it's not a different gospel. It's all one gospel. Maybe we can think of it as a multifaceted a multifaceted concept with the core being the sacrifice of Jesus for forgiveness of sins and his righteousness being imputed to us. Okay, let's, let's move on here. How many more do I have? I think I have, uh, okay, so, so we have at least uh, maybe one more passage and we'll take a break, okay? 
So now we, we have a relationship of gospel to kingdom. And now I want to bring in another concept, covenant. <laughs> so what is the gospel's relationship to covenant, okay? So we want to look at this relationship here, okay? And this is, again, going to be fundamental because we're not going to see the word gospel in the Old Testament all the time. We're going to see these other words, okay? So covenant. Let's look at this word covenant. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 22, 14 to 22. So Luke chapter 22, 14 to 22. Let's go there. So uh, for those of you familiar with Luke 22, 14, this is the Lord's Supper. So this is the first time that Jesus has the Lord's Supper with his, the, we sometimes call it the Last Supper. It's the first, <laughs> it's, it's the, the first Lord's Supper for the church because we're going to follow the pattern. But, it, but for Jesus, it was his Last Supper before his sacrifice. I want to read this to you. And what I want you to be thinking about is, although you might not see the precise word, think about if you seek some concepts. See if you can see some concepts here. Okay. Uh, when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So, <laughs> looks, looks familiar. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, I from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Very similar. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me is on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he, has, he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which one of them could it be who was going to do this? Okay, so this is the foundation for the Lord's Supper. And I hope that you can see some, I hope that you can see some important uh, concepts that we've already had. Coming back up here, what was the first concept that you noticed that just stuck out like a sore thumb. <clears throat> oh my goodness, that was painful. What is this first concept that you saw here reading through this? It's the Lord's Supper. Okay, the Lord's Supper, yeah. So looking at our, the, the, the passages we've already discussed, what are some, Let's highlight some, let's go through here first and highlight some key words, some key ideas that we've already discussed. Just give, I'll, just give me a concept that we've seen or discussed already, an idea, and we'll highlight it and then we'll discuss. So does anyone have one? The new covenant. Okay, so that, so the new covenant, that would be a new term, right? That's, that's, uh, we haven't yet explicitly identified it yet. That, that's, that's the new term that we're going to be looking at. So that, that's present in this context. Great, great observation, uh, Kuli and Danny. So in this context, we have new covenant. Now, what are some other concepts in relationship to the gospel that, we, that we've already seen? Do this in remembrance of me. Okay, so what is that in specific to our study already? Kuya Boboy, what's, what's that in relationship to? It's it that we are going to do. Proclaim the gospel. Well, um, no, I guess what I'm saying is, Diba, we have, we have, a, we have a preceding uh, significances that we've already highlighted. So I, I'm looking for those significances in this context. So, yeah, so it's the do this in remembrance of me, that, that would be new, Diba. That's not, that's not what we were discovered. Danny, go ahead. 16, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Excellent. So, so this idea here, we've just that's we we've, we've just discussed kingdom. So that's the first. That's the first one that is something that is we've already discussed. Great. What's another concept that we've already discussed that is present in this context? So we're looking for the same idea. Maybe it's in a little bit different wording, uh, but it's not a new concept. It's old. Until the kingdom of God comes. Until so yeah, great. So we have a second one here. So this is again referencing. So the kingdom of now this is the kingdom of God coming, Diva. So here this is fulfilled, and now it's come. So this is the kingdom of God is fundamental to the Lord's Supper. <laughs> Right. Uh, what are some other what, what are some other components of the gospel that we've discussed that's in present in this context? Kuya Boboy was close when he said, "Do this in remembrance of me." He was close. What, what about what about this? My blood poured out for you. My body given for you. Is this not his sacrifice? For our sins. The same. What was delivered to me of force important, I have delivered it to you. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This cup that is poured out for you is the covenant of my blood. This is saying the same thing with slightly different way. And the importance for us is new covenant. So when we see, and specifically in the new covenant, we're looking at a sacrifice. Think about in the, in the Old Covenant, right? So look at this. We can compare this to the Old Covenant. And there's, there's, <laughs> there's many sacrifices here. Okay? But all of this is pointing to this and ultimately pointing to, to Christ's sacrifice. So when you see this idea of covenant, we're going to, this, is, this semester, we're going to discuss, what is this covenant? What, what, what's going on with this covenant? But what I want us to see here is that, is that the new idea, this, when you see new covenant, it's not different. Than, this is, this is the, the fundamental component of the gospel. So maybe that was the confusion. Maybe the confusion was is that you were identifying already. You were making that connection of, New covenant with the sacrifice, with the gospel. Maybe that was the confusion that, that I, I wasn't really clear on. But this is a new idea that we typically don't think about, okay? But every month in our church, every month in our church, we celebrate the new covenant. And, and Paul actually says, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians... 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. That when we partake of the, of, the, of the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. So I am going to, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize. We are proclaiming the gospel. So when you celebrate the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming the gospel. So this is why sometimes they refer to the means of grace, not that 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 the Lord's Supper is is, is giving us salvific grace. Absolutely not. 
but it's a means of grace by which we can proclaim the gospel. We are proclaiming the grace of God in this, in this act, in this event. Uh, we we, we want to emphasize this idea here of what Kuya Boboy or uh, yeah, Kuya Boboy said that this is do this in remembrance of me. So this is this is a reminder in Alam. Remember, this is not there's this is a memorial. This does not become Christ's blood. There's only one sacrifice. When we do systematic study, uh, systematic theology later, we will study the atonement, okay? But here it's clear. It's, it's do this in remembrance. Don't do this. Don't partake of my body. It's do this in remembrance of me. Those are the words of Jesus. Uh, so what I want us, we're going to take a break now. Let's, we're going to take a, uh, a seven-minute break. But what I want us to see here, brothers and sisters, is that the, the, the gospel is interconnected with kingdom, kingdom of God, and covenant. They're all interconnected. They're all a part of the same thing. And when we see these concepts in the Old Testament, we should be thinking these concepts are pointing towards the, 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 the coming reality, the coming reality of Christ, the coming reality of the sacrifice, the coming reality of the kingdom, okay? This is the gospel. This, these are the good news. And most fundamental is this, uh, uh, the covenant in my blood is most fundamental, okay? Let's go ahead and let's take a seven-minute break. Let's, let's get back to, to finishing up the, this, these introductory issues. And so uh, we are almost finished. So let's just quickly, I'm just going to highlight some of the, the truths that we discovered in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 22. And so number one, the Lord's Supper is a picture of Christ's sacrifice. So when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming the sacrifice, the gospel of of God, the good news that Christ died for our sins. And so uh, the new truth that we, I hope that we all discovered was that this is the new covenant. Now the new covenant is in, is promised throughout the Old Testament, especially in the prophets. And so uh, there's, we are part of this new covenant community. And maybe that's a, a new revelation for you. Maybe you've not thought, thought of that in, in, in that perspective before. But there is, there is a, a, we are part of the new covenant, and it's, and it's the Jewish, it's part of the, the, the plan of salvation for the Jews, and so we are a part of that, and so people have different ways of describing that, but nonetheless, we celebrate the new covenant every month. We celebrate this Jewish activity every month, every month, because really it's not Jewish, it's, it's, uh, it's for Jew and Greek, the gospel is for Jew and Greek, it's for, it's for all nations, and we, we saw that, we will see that in the promise, in the Abrahamic uh, covenant promise. So moving along here, uh, the Lord's Supper is a picture of Christ's sacrifice. It is a picture of the gospel. So to be very specific, it, it is the sacrifice of the new covenant. So we're just really highlighting these, these truths, to be clear. Uh, and, and, and also it's interconnected with God's kingdom. So uh, we can't we can't separate all these things into different. They're, they're all interconnected. They're all related. And, and, and hopefully soon we'll, we'll see that uh, connection. And so if you see the concept of sacrifice, covenant, kingdom in, Old Test, in the Old Testament, be looking for a relationship to the gospel in Christ. There's going to be some form of relationship there. And we need to be looking for those things. The last passage of scripture that we're going to look at, I, we're not going to kind of work through there. I'll just give you the, the bullet points so that we can move on to the to the to to to, to, uh, to studying Genesis. But if you want, if you want, you can turn in uh, to, to Romans chapter sixteen, Romans chapter sixteen, verses twenty-five to twenty-seven. And so here I have it up. I already have my notes, so you can see my notes there. So we don't have time to unpack these. I'll just read this and then highlight some, some, some significance for us. Now, so this is the end of the book of Romans. This is literally the, the proclamation. It's, 
I, I describe Romans as the gospel described in Romans 1 to 11, the gospel applied in Romans 12 to 14. So in 1 to 11, it's, it's the, the gospel's description, and then 12 to 16, it's its application in the church, okay? And so the, at the conclusion, the very end of the, the epistle to the Romans, now to him who is able to strengthen, strengthen you according to my gospel, uh, even the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept a, lo- a secret a long time ago, long ages ago, but has now been disclosed, uh, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. According to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus. Amen. So I just want to highlight a couple of things. The first thing I really want to highlight here is that this word and, this word and, uh, in Greek, the word and can be and as in two. So go to the store and to the mall. And that could be, that, that's two different ideas. So the word can be used in that context. Or it can be used in a context of even or a clarification. So you can say, go to the resort to the pool to get my towel. Or you would say, go to the resort and the pool to get my towel. That's how you'd say it in Greek. But really the and is not go to the resort and then the pool. It's go to the resort. What part of the resort? The pool, okay? So that's, that's how the Greek word and, it's chi in Greek for those who, who maybe know Greek. But um, so what we, what we don't want to say here is uh, Paul isn't saying my gospel one and, uh, and the preaching of Jesus. He's not saying that. What he's saying is according to my gospel, to be precise, the preaching of Jesus. Okay, so so we could use, we could write here uh, to be precise, or you could say even according to my gospel, even the preaching of Christ. Okay, so we don't want it's not two ideas; it's it's one idea and then a clarification. Okay. And so, but the, but the big point I want to draw for our specific purposes, so we have this, we have the gospel here, it's being d- defined as the preaching of Jesus, the Abbot. Um, but then you have this very specific, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed. And especially it's been disclosed through the prophetic writings. So the gospel was in the prophetic writings. And then we could say, well, what are the prophetic writings? Uh, This would be all the prophets. And this would also include David, because David spoke prophetically in the Psalms. (laughs) And then also Moses. And the reason why we can be sure of this is you'd say, so this is, a, this, you would say this is almost the entire Old Testament. So I, I don't want to say it is the Old Testament. We would say it's maybe uh, almost, almost the Old Testament. And the reason why we can be sure of this is because when Paul quotes the Old Testament, he's quoting all over the Old Testament. There is a lot of prophets. He's, he's, he's quoting most of the prophets, but he also quotes from the Psalms. And he also quotes from Moses, from the law, okay? So, so to further define prophetic writings, uh, we need to include uh, the law and also David's, some of David's Psalms. Because when you look at all the different citations throughout the book of Romans, you have all those contained. So is everyone tracking with me there? But, but the big takeaway for us is that his gospel has been, look at this, the action is, has been made known, so this is the action, and then this is the object here, all the nations, and what's the means? It's not, 
you know, we think, oh, we preach the gospel from the Bible. We preach the gospel from the New Testament. What's the means here? What's the means? The means is the Old Testament. <laughs> so my question for you is, could you share the gospel from the Old Testament? You know, we're, we're, we're maybe doing the Romans road. We're maybe doing uh, a parable in, from Jesus' con in Jesus' uh, the gospels. Very few of us are going to the Old Testament to proclaim the gospel. But, but that should be a challenge for us, that the gospel is there. The gospel is present in the Old Testament, and, and we do need to improve our proclamation of the gospel from the Old Testament. Uh, we need to improve that. So I'm hoping this big story of the Bible can help us in, that, in there. Uh, any comments or questions before we, we conclude this part of our introduction to the course? Any comments or questions? The, is there an explanation, Tim, why the different principles are scattered in so many parts of the Bible, in so many writings? Why are they scattered in different parts of the Bible? What, 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 what is scattered? The one you're referring to, you find this in uh, Corinthians, there is a passage in Revelation, you go to Colossians, you go to, and uh, you find the connection between this word and this concept and this principle. Yeah, so, okay, so the reason why we're, okay, so the reason why I'm doing this is because, just to be clear, um, uh, we, we could just work through the book of Romans. In, in many ways, Paul also is giving the big story in the book of Romans. We could do that. Fair enough. But the reason why I'm going to these different passages is because the Jewish mind, Paul's mind, they automatically thought uh, the, the covenant, the kingdom, and the gospel was it, it was it was how they spoke. It was it, it was it was in their mind. For for us Gentiles in the in the church, we kind of a lot of those. In some ways, that's culture. In some ways, that's religion. We don't really speak in those ways. So I chose specific passages that were so clear. You see the correlation between the two, and you can't. There's no negotiation because this what we're discussing here. Is, is debated. Some people, I know in some circles, they want to keep covenant separate from the gospel. They want to keep kingdom separate from the gospel. So I've, I've chosen the, the clearest passages that just connect the two, and it's, well, I'm escape. You cannot escape. It's, it's crystal clear. So that's kind of why I'm jumping around in the New Testament. We, we, we could just talk through God the book of uh, the book of Romans but there's nowhere that it's just crystal clear where Paul connects the kingdom it, it's connected through Christ it's connected through the lordship of Christ okay but someone would say okay find the lordship of Christ but but it's not connected to kingdom okay do you see what I'm saying so I'm really I'm drawing those different concepts and these are the clearest examples yeah so great question really good question and I'm glad you asked it yeah uh Kuya Henry, you had a question. Uh, in Jesus has mentioned about the law of Moses and the prophet. Right? He did not come to... What word do you say? He did not come to abolish. to abolish the law of Moses and the prophet. But to fulfill. But to fulfill. So it is this. Uh, in his mention, uh, he meant about the gospel. Yeah, so that's, so now, now in Jesus' context, it's specifically concerning the law. So he did not come to abolish the law, uh, the, the, the prophets or the law, but to fulfill. But he's really focusing, I mean, there's debate there, but he's really focusing upon, um, because the, the law is the core. Really, the prophets, the prophets are just applying the law. <laughs> the, the prophets are applying the law. They're saying, you're not keeping the covenant, the the, the, the Maybe we'll have time, maybe another class. The prophets came on the scene when, when, when Israel was not keeping the covenant. And they're saying, it would be like a covenantal lawsuit. They would say, I am calling heavens and earth as witnesses that you are not keeping the covenants. And so God is going to judge you. But don't worry, there is, because of his faithfulness to the patriarchs, there is also will be a promise of salvation. So that's really the prophets. So when we can speak of the law and the prophets as the Old Testament, but really the law is the core of the Old Testament. And then the prophets are, uh, 
Israel, how are you doing with the law? <laughs> right? And then the, the, the writings, the, the, the Psalms, and the Proverbs, again, it's related to, it's worship. It's related to the, to, to the law. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's somewhat a, a, a false dichotomy. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. In the, in the Old Testament, since that law, since that law was specifically given to the Israelites, so it was an obedience coming from them, then where is that salvation? So we'll, we'll see that. <laughs> we'll see that, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's really good. That's a great question because some people would say, and I think I mentioned this before, some people would say that the whole law is just all works, salvation by works, and New Testament salvation by grace. But we're going to see that, no, salvation by grace through faith is in the Old Testament. It's in, it's in Noah's day. It's even in the fall of Adam. It's in Noah's day. It's in Abraham. Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. It was in the Exodus. And even in the giving of the law, there is a continual command to trust in the word of God. So Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So this, this is trust. So, so it's a bad reading. It's a very bad reading to read the Old Testament as, as a... Uh, as a works base, that that's that's a that's a bad reading, and so we want to work through that. That's part of the part of the job. So let's go ahead. Let's make. If there's, are there any other questions? I don't want to. I don't want to rush. Any other questions? And we'll go on. Yeah, one one question. Is the is the emergence of the law during the time of Moses a consequence of what Adam did at the Garden of Eden? In, in some ways, it is a consequence, but in other ways, it's part. It's part of the promise that's leading up to the Messiah. So it's a consequence in, in the fact that it's part of the, the gospel. It's part of the, the, the promise leading to the, to the Messiah. So, yes, we can see it as a consequence because they fell. And so then God is going to, to save man, and the law is part of that step towards the salvation of mankind. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to say, so uh, it, it is, the law is also, uh, because the, the, the covenant, the new covenant is, uh, Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We don't want to say that it's a consequence in that it wasn't ordained, it was ordained in the mind of God before even the fall. Okay, so we don't want to say that it was like, man fell, ah. Oh, Man fell, what am I gonna do? Okay, we gotta have a law. We gotta come up with a law. We we don't wanna we don't wanna think of it in like the, those categories. That it's God's reaction to man's fall. It's it's part of God's plan in spite of man's failure. We we wanna think of it in those categories. Yeah. If we do not connect that mosaic law to the fall of man, then we cannot we cannot connect it to the coming of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ made the, the pronouncement that he came to fulfill the law. So what is the connection of that law to the fall of Adam? That's, that's where I'm leading to that question. Why? That's why I'm saying that's the consequence. Because later Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. We will, let's, let's in due time, in due time, we will, in due time, we will, we will get there. So let's, let's, let's be thinking about that question. It's a great question. Let's be thinking about that. Okay, let's draw some significance because I do want to start our, for our assignment, we're, we're, it's already becoming late here. Uh, yeah, so let's just really summarize some points here. So what I want to highlight here quickly is the gospel and the preaching of Christ was a mystery hidden in the prophetic writings of the OT now revealed. And I don't want to exclude uh, uh, David's, because David prophetically spoke in the Psalms. I don't want to exclude Moses. I'm just keeping the, 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 the terminology that Paul uses. And so here we go. Prophetic writings includes all prophets, including Moses and David. So we want to include that because, again, he quotes them in, in, in the book of Romans. So it's, that's, in his, that's in his mind. Um, and then also, if you want to look at this idea of mystery, this could be an extra passage that you could go to, uh, Ephesians 3, 1 to 10. You don't have to, but that, that would be a, a bonus if you want to write that down to, to, to contemplate this idea of mystery, this idea of mystery. Okay, okay, so um, we don't have time to go here. We'll just, 
I, I'll just, you can, you can do this on your own time. It's really self-explanatory. If you go to Luke chapter 24, 25 to 27, and also 44 to 47. But in this passage, Christ says that um, uh, Christ interpreted all the scriptures concerning himself, all the prophetic writings, including Moses. And so uh, Christ, this is the road, the road to Emmaus. The disciples were downcast, and Christ says, you hard-hearted, you did not believe all that the scriptures said about himself, that the Christ must suffer and be resurrected. And then it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And then he also says in verses 44 to 47, all things written in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so, again, this idea that this is not plan B, again, the idea that this is not some type of, uh, of a reaction to, the, to mankind, but fulfillment of God's plan to save mankind. This is the, this is the big story that God had planned from before the ages began. Okay, I really, we, we really want to emphasize that. Okay, so we began with a core, we began with a core definition of the gospel, and we've worked through some of these concepts and ideas. We've made some interrelationships. And so now we are moving to the big, the comprehensive definition. This is this is by uh, this is by a uh, uh, theologian, so perhaps I would say it maybe a little differently. I, I like it. I like it, though. So uh, I think it's very helpful for our discussion. So we'll just include it here. And uh, this is from uh, Graham Goldsworthy, According to Plan, the Unfolding Revelation of God in the Bible. And so he defines this. The gospel is the message of the kingdom of God as it comes through the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son of God. I added that. So I added the Christ, the Son of God. The gospel centers on the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And I added, and enthronement of Jesus as God's way of saving us from death and making us members of his eternal kingdom. Okay, so this is a comprehensive definition. We could include covenant in there. Perhaps I will, I will make another emendation and include covenant because I want to include covenant in there as well. Although it is present in the, in the, death, in the death of Christ. So, it, so covenant is present there. It's not explicit. But this is a good comprehensive definition. It's, it's, com it's combining Christ, sacrifice of sins, kingdom, covenant. It's all... This is the good news. Okay, so now we're going to creation by the word and the Adamic covenant. So let us turn now in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I cannot read all of Genesis because it's going to take too long. So what I've done is I've somewhat condensed and I've, I've made it reduced a little bit. So I hope that... Uh, uh, those who have already read it, we should all be familiar with it. So I pulled some things out so that I'll, what I'll do is I'll just read the important things and you can share other ideas that you have even outside. Uh, what we'll do is we'll do a, a period of maybe uh, five to 10 minutes of just sharing your observations, your questions. We'll continue this in the next week. So uh, we'll just continue this in the next week. So uh, I'll go ahead and read the word of God and then we'll have a, a brief discussion and just We'll carry this on the next week. And of course, you'll still have your assignment because this will go right into the fall of man. It'll, it'll be a nice segue. So we'll, do, we'll still do the fall of man next week with this. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Then there was evening and morning the first day. So then day two, we have the firmament. Day three, we have the, we have the dry land, vegetation, plants, and trees. Day four, we have the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, we have, we have the fish and the birds. Day six, we have animals and mankind. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds 
of the heavens, over all the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Then there was evening, and then there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished all the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So, so continuing now in verse 15, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, You shall surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So God, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord had, God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the woman were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Okay, so... That's a lot. That's a lot of real estate. <laughs> That's a lot. Let's discuss from those who did the assignment. I apologize for Kuya Boba. I forgot to send him the assignment. Please forgive me, Kuya. Uh, for those who did the assignment, what are your observations or questions? What are your observations or questions? I also am thinking about including, you were supposed to read John 1, 1 to 17, and also Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 21. Uh, Hebrews 1 to 4, 1, 1 to 4, uh, Psalm 8. What are some of your observations or questions in relationship to this, to this passage? Just, you, would, you can just give me your observation or ask your question, and we'll connect it to some place here. Uh, what are your observations or questions that you want to include? Yes. Okay, in chapter 1, verse 27, observation, uh, it says, God's word says, the creation of human, it was the creation of human being. And verse 31, okay, in Genesis 20, uh, 27, it's about the creation of human beings. And in verse 31, God said, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. So I emphasize the word very good when God saw, and in that is found in verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. I emphasize the word finished. And all of the host of them. Okay, my observation. Considering God's attributes of constancy and integrity, does it mean that all God's creation will be in the new heaven? Okay, so hold on. Let's 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 so that's a question. Your observation was was all things were very good, especially the creation of mankind. And I like I really like that, that observation because it's emphasizing the, the perfect work of God because we'll see uh, in new creation, we are his new creatures, right? And so, again, this idea of, of what God creates is perfect. So let's just first write out here, all things were, were very good, especially the creation of mankind. And so the observation I think you're making is uh, God creates let's put um uh 
without flaw, without mistake. So then your question, so then the question that you have, Kuya Henry, is will all creation Essentially, you're saying we'll be recreated in the new heavens and the new earth, correct? Yes. Let's try to answer that question. If not this, this week, next week, okay? That's a great question to ask. Crystal and Geraldine, do you have one? I, I saw you were trying. Go ahead. Um, we have a question. Go ahead. In Genesis 1, verse 26, the God first time to say that, let us make, let us make man in our image. Um, who is she referring to that they called, who is us, who is with God when she created him? How would he say that? So you're asking, so let me try to clarify the question because it was a little hard for me here. Are you saying, uh, what did it, what did he mean when he said create them in, in him, is it in his image? Is that what you're asking? What did he mean? Image, of, what does image of God mean? Is that the question? Who is this us? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I missed that. Okay. No, great. Excellent question. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. That's a great question. I, I, I couldn't hear. That's, that's great. So uh, the question is, who is the us? Great question. Good job. That, that's, that's a great observation. Uh, who, who else? Who else has a question or an observation? I, I want to hear from more of you. That, that, yeah, I that think goes, that's oh, sorry. <laughs> Ladies, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, the girl's question goes along with what I, one of the observations I made in chapter one, verse two, it talks about the spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm assuming that's referring to the Holy Spirit. I just blew me away how often the Trinity is mentioned in this oh, okay. chapter. So let's so let's write this down. Um, I think it's three times in this chapter alone, three or four times. So what's interesting is that God created, God said, God said, but then just randomly the spirit of God was there, right? So that's that's where I'm saying it's different. It just seems out of place. Why is it just say, and God was hovering over the face of the deep? Why is there this, why is there this, uh, this seems to be out of place here. So let's, let's highlight this here. Great observation, Bethany. Don't forget Tito Boboy. Yes, I, I won't forget him. Let me just fix this here. I'm struggling. Hold up. And then we also want to we ask the question Trinity. Trinity present. So Kuya Boboy, go ahead. I am referring to verse 27. Uh, please, please uh, bring us to verse 27. You see. Uh, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him. And then male and female, he created them. Don't you see a contrast or a seeming confusion here in 27? In the second sentence, in the image of God, he created him singular. The next sentence, male and female, he created them in its plural. So what is the significance of the singular and plural description of man and female? And then... The most debated question, which is uh, difficult to answer, is did God create uh, created only one man then or many men and women then? 
Okay, so here. First to the seven is concerned. In asking that question, it is interesting uh, if you look in chapter two. So perhaps chapter two has the hint um, between the him and the them, but we'll see. We'll see about that. Great question. Great question. Who else? I want some other, I want some other participation here. What other observations or questions that you had? Evening? Uh, Pastor Tim, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I didn't do the assignment, but yeah, <laughs> while, I was, while I was reading, it's in Psalm, Psalm 8. Okay, go ahead. And then Psalms 8, it tells about um, what is meant that thou art mindful of him and the son of man, which is in, um, what do you call this, in small letter. Okay. And the son of man, thou visitest him. So I think it's, is it talking about um is it talking about us the people right uh, i i i am not because it's in a small letter yeah and yeah, then, yeah, yeah yeah yes 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 and then um in colossians 115 because we know that adam is the first the first uh creature that god created and then there's this in Colossians 115, the firstborn of every creature. And I think it's talking about Jesus Christ. Yes. And is, and is it right that Jesus Christ is also known as the second Adam? Something. Because I, I, I remember that there was this lesson that there's the first Adam and the second Adam. Well, I, uh, that's my question. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. So first Adam and second Adam. And yes. also this this firstborn of creation. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's so <laughs> thank you, Pastor. No problem. That's it. Good. We have a lot, we'll have a lot to discuss. Tim, can I add in my because uh, I saw in verse 28 uh, relate related to my question in 27. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. 28, it says there, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So that's why it's related. Because if only one man was created in verse 27, how can he continue and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it? If there's only one man, how can he multiply? So it, it is related to the to the male, male and female. He created them in 27. Okay, so let's 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 look at that. Let's look at the significance of this. This uh, this is a command here. So I'll just give you a little bit, a little hint. Uh, these are commands. We'll look at this commands. Great. I'm not answering. So may I continue? I have a question in chapter two. Okay. In chapter two, in uh, when God said it is not good for man to be alone. What does it really mean by that? Great question. What else do we have? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, we, have a, we have a question here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my observation is, when God commanded Adam not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, is it, it, it was delivered to Adam alone? Because if we read in verse 17, it says, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Or, so is it, uh, I'm asking if it's delivered only to Adam. Because later on, uh, Adam and Eve was created in the later part, in the later part of Genesis chapter 2, in verse 19 no, 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 no. in verse 20, 22 yeah 21 to 22 yeah no that's a that's great no that's a great question and 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 it does seem it does seem that 
it was given to Adam originally. And so the question would be, did he have a duty to proclaim the word to his wife? Yes, yes. Uh, was it delivered <laughs> properly? Because in, in verse 3, I mean, chapter 3 of Genesis, we can see the, the uh, we can see the answer of uh, no, the answer of you when you say that uh, the the twist of the the temptation of Adam I mean that uh, of the serpent to Eve you will not surely die and you can and what is it, what the word there Lord God said indeed has God said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden then from the from the fruit of the trees of the gar garden we may eat but from the fruit of the tree which is i think in the middle he views that the middle of the garden yeah but god <laughs> says you 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 can eat freely yeah. but you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thus uh adam mentioned it to eve properly. yeah no. No, that's a great question. We're going to investigate that because one of those, one of the concepts is this idea of the proclamation of the word of God. And the, God gave Adam a word. Yes, yes. <laughs> gave a word. And so even if there was a miscommunication, well, I won't, I'm not going to spoil it. No, but you're, you're really thinking in the right category. We're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at this idea of, of proclaiming the word of God faithfully and this idea that Adam was a prophet. So Adam as a, as the first Adam. So, so Kea brought up the second, the last Adam, there is this correlation between the two, between Adam and Christ, uh, or I should say uh, Adam and Christ. And uh, Adam in many ways was the prototype, the first type of prophet, priest, and king. And he failed. And we're going to see that, that, that Christ is the last Adam. He's the true prophet, priest, and king. And so in proclaiming the word, there's a prophetic function there. So I'm not going to spoil too much, but you're, you're really tracking in the right area. So the assignment next week, which will be Genesis 3, maybe you can, you can explore some of those, uh, those thoughts that you have at the, and write them down. I, I think you're tracking in a good, in a good place. Uh, any other comments or questions? The time, It's already 9 o'clock. Anyone else want to add? I don't want to take anyone. I think Nanette says here, what does the word beginning refer to? So great question. So Nanette's question is this idea here. Great question, Ati Nanette. Okay, we're going to close because it's already 9 o'clock. I do want to ask, did anyone see a place, where, did anyone see in this context a place where they would think that Jesus could be present or it could be pointing towards Jesus or there's some relationship to Jesus? Did anyone see a place in this context where we could, we could see we can see, or th the scripture refers to it referring to Jesus. Does anyone have, does anyone I, have? Anything? I think, sir, the word, the like. Lord God. So, so first, Lord's Harvest, go ahead. I think it's Lily Beth. Uh, the Lord God. Uh, the Lord God was mentioned 11 times. So the name given to creator, so it's Jehovah. The Lord, Jehovah, the Lord, in the first, it was called Elohim, a God of power, but now Jehovah Elohim is a God of power and perfection. Okay. And the, and the, if the Lord, the Lord God is mentioned there. Uh, the previous is about God. God, God is thirty-nine times was mentioned. Oh wow. Then the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God is. It was in verse and in Genesis one two, but in Genesis one twenty six, so the Trinity was present. So using the word, uh, I mean the us and our. So when I'm looking about where is Jesus in this creation, so I'm not sure that the Genesis 2, 4 to 25, so the Lord God was mentioned there 11 times. So it re refers to, I think, Jesus Christ. So, so yeah, so it, um, 
Yeah, it's 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 not crystal clear there if it's Jesus Christ. It does. It could be the Father. It could be referring to the Father. It's not clear. Uh, what about? There be light, and there was light. Yeah. It yeah. John. Yeah. So, so you said John. How does John call Jesus? Ati How does John? How does John one call refer to? The word, right? So in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God from the beginning. So do we have in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God from the beginning? Yeah. It's in Genesis, I from John 1, 1, 2. And the word became flesh. So so here's a question for for you. It uh do we have any words of God in Genesis 1? Do we have any words of God? The beginning in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, but 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 is not when God speaks that's the word. So when God said, if we're thinking about this, the means by which by which God speaks is the word, right? Let there be light. Then God said, let there be light. In my, uh, in my observation also, sir, in when he did the decoration, he uses the word, everything is it. Let there be light and there was light. So the word is powerful there. Because sir, everything is, he uses the word, he uh, uses the creation from day one to uh, day six. Mm -hmm. But when he created man, he uses he form he form a dust he form uh, he, he form a dust and he formed a man yeah. using the dust so there is affection there is a relationship so it means uh, that's what also my observation he uses the word during the creation word word let there be the word is powerful there yeah let there be light and there was light let there be night and he called it day and night yeah. So, so what I think you're trying to say, Ati, is that it's powerful and it's because when God speaks, according to John, that's actually the living word. That's, that's, that's Jesus. That's yes. the presence of Jesus. Okay. Um, and so that's really the connection of where Jesus is present in Genesis 1. And then the other thing we have, we're, we're going to come back. I'm just giving you a little bit of a I want to close on thinking about Jesus Christ. That's kind of that's kind of my thinking here before we finish the, the discussion next week. The other idea is in this um, the, the Colossians 1 15 says he is the Jesus is the the image of the invisible God. And so, and so, of course, Adam is made in the image of God, but there's, there's no, I mean, it's such, a, it's such a, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's analogy there, but it's, you cannot even compare the two because one is creation, one is, one is God, one is eternal. But what's the most amazing thing is that in the creation of Adam, that's going to serve as a type to point towards the time when God himself comes into the world and becomes visible. Jesus is God with us. The invisible, eternal God of the universe has become visible in the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so this is the first type, the first step towards God dwelling with us, right? So God dwells with us in the garden. And then we're separated, and so then God is, God is going to still dwell with man. And so let let's close on that idea. Um, we really haven't discussed Genesis one. We've kind of given you some ideas and thoughts for you to to think about. And uh, what I want to do now is just let's finish with the homework, and um, we'll finish Genesis one and two, and we'll make significance the big components because there is some deep truths that I want you to pick up on for the creation 
Uh, but the homework for next week will be Genesis 3. So I want you to read Genesis 3. I want you to read Romans 1, 16 to, uh, 1, 16 to 3, 20. Romans 5, 12 to 20. And then also make observations and ask questions. Uh, this will be for the CM, the CT students. I'm going to give you some additional, so maybe 1 Corinthians 15. There'll be additional passages for you to look at. So this is the assignment just for the CM. I'll have several more passages that I want everyone else, the, the CT, the Certificate of Theology students to look at, okay? And looking at, uh, we're, reading, we're reading Genesis uh, biblically. We're reading Genesis in view of, of the revelation of God. After seeing Jesus come in as a man and now being exalted in the right hand. And so uh, I hope that this is making sense. Maybe you're a little confused. But we're, we're looking, we're looking at, at the major points in the history of salvation with this eye of, of, of who Christ is and who the gospel is. So right now, I hope that things are coming together. The, the, the big takeaway I want, I want us to see is that Jesus is present in the creative event. The Holy Spirit is present. The Trinitarian God is present in the creation of the world. Um, and then we're going to draw out some more significance. We're going to look at what it means to be in the image of God. We're going to look at this Adamic covenant next week. And also we'll be discussing the, the fall of man. And so uh, just be keeping those questions that I gave to you in your mind as you make observations and ask questions. And uh, the big takeaway for tonight that I don't want us to forget sight on is the gospel fundamentally is us being saved from our sin, receiving the Christ's righteousness, and also proclaiming Jesus is Lord, and it's, and it's connected with the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of God. It's connected with the new covenant. Uh, these are all interrelated. And so with the, 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 the event on which everything turns is Christ's sacrifice for our sins so that we can be members of God's kingdom. It's Christ's sacrifice of sin so that we can be in the presence of God forevermore, that we can be members of his kingdom. And uh, without this covenant and the sacrifice of the blood, we do not have good news. Without the resurrection, exaltation, and ascension uh, and enthronement of Jesus Christ, we don't have good news. And so um, I hope now that the, 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 the big story will start to unfold uh, beginning next week. Let's close in prayer. And... Uh, can I ask, may I ask um, uh, Ati Lilibeth, can you close us in prayer, please? All right, well, then I'll just have, um, can I have uh, uh, Kea, can you close us in prayer, please? Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful evening. Lord, um, I have learned a lot, Lord, and I praise your name for giving all of us this opportunity, dear Father, to know more about you. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that tonight you, you continue to bless each and every one of us. Give us, Lord, the wisdom, Lord, to, and the strength, Lord, to continue to study your word. And Lord, uh, I pray for Pastor Tim, that you continue to strengthen him and bless him, Lord, and his family, Lord. Keep them safe, Lord, as well. And to all the members, Lord, um, strengthen all of us that we would not falter, Lord, and we would not stop learning, Lord, about your word. All this, Lord, I ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.